Hi there, good morning everybody, um, or good evening, or good afternoon, or very good morning if you're in the US, but, but a lot of our people joining today are in Asia, so good evening to you. Um, I'm Mark von Grundherr, I'm a director of Benham and Reeves, and I'm based in London, and I'm delighted today um, to host this for you. I hope you'll find it interesting, and as you know, so much has been going on in the market over the last year. Um, and there's been so much conflicting information from different sources. So as a business, we wanted to get a trusted, true expert to update us all on, on what's really been happening and to hear his predictions. So I'm really pleased that we managed to persuade Graham Norwood to be with us today. Um, I'm personally actually really excited, even though I actually work in the market, as you know, um, to hear what he thinks has been going on and he's going to share with us. And just briefly, for those of you that don't know Graham, he's a freelance property writer. He's been doing it for the last 20 years. After previously having worked as a business journalist for the BBC, he's had regular columns on residential property markets in the Financial Times, the Daily Telegraph. And he now contributes frequently to the Times, the Sunday Times, the Daily Mail, as well as editing three daily online property industry publications. Um, and in recognition of his property expertise, he's actually won loads of awards, including Property Journalist of the Year. So that's, that's Graham for you. And once he's finished, I'll come back and share a few thoughts and a little bit about Benham and Reeves for those of you that don't know, know us. Um, and then Graham and I will finish by answering any questions or as many questions as, as we can. Feel free to answer them in the, in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Um, so thank you very much uh, once again for joining. And now over to the star of the show, Graham, over to you, thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. I hope I'll be able to live up to your very generous and flattering billing. Um, over the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to cover six different areas uh, which we put on this slide. The first is a brief look at what the London market is like now because it's very difficult to read any market currently because of what's been happening with coronavirus. Um, the second slide that we'll uh, look at after this introduction is um, what we are calling in the UK the cliff edge. There's a key date coming up in five weeks time, which um, will see the end of a very significant tax break that's been offered to buyers in the UK which has had a very significant impact on the market. Um, after that, we're going to look at uh, coronavirus. There's been uh, a major announcement in the UK about uh, changes to restrictions, and we'll be looking at what that might mean for the housing market uh, generally and within London. Of course, we'll be looking at Brexit, which has had an impact on the capital's housing market for the past four years. We'll then be looking at uh, really a prediction from myself and from a number of leading estate agencies and analysts about what London's market will look like in 2023. And finally, we'll just remind ourselves of why so many people have invested in London over the years, its fundamental characteristics and whether those will survive the big changes that we've had because of the virus, Brexit and global activity. So thank you for um, joining me. And if we could have the next slide, please. This is a look at London's market now. Now, the point of me being here is to give, um, as the webinar's title suggests, an unbiased view. And there's no point in trying to gloss over the fact that a lot of London has had fundamental difficulties in recent years because of Brexit and now because of coronavirus. And that has uh, clearly influenced some uh, of the housing market. But I just want to start off by saying that it's a very mixed picture and it's not all bad news. For example, a recent survey of the 20 locations in the UK which have had the most sales by value in uh, 2020, London still dominated that by some margin with 11 out of the top 20. Now, some of those, of course, were um, the most uh, expensive locations which make it easy, if you like, for them to get into a top 20, like Westminster and Kensington and Chelsea, central London locations that will be familiar to 
uh, everybody who's on this webinar, I'm sure, wherever they are in the world. But there were also outer London locations that got in there as well. Areas like Wandsworth, areas like Barnet, and areas like um, Brent, which are not normally recognised as key locations in which to buy, yet still did perform well in the past 12 months. Another indicator which is uh, significant is that 52% of all the new build homes in London, in Greater London last year, were bought off plan. Now I'm sure most people know what off plan is, but in case they don't, it's houses or, and apartments that were bought prior to their construction. This is critical for developers because they need cash flow and they get some of that cash flow and some of the um, leverage they have with investors is by getting um, uh, properties bought off plan. But that's quite a risky activity for many people. And the fact that 52% of all London new build homes last year were bought off plan is actually a sign of an underlying investor commitment to London, which perhaps gets overlooked given the worst news that we've had about the housing market in other places. And finally, uh, outer London rents were up 6.2% in 2020. That's quite a significant sum by anybody's um, margin. But actually, if you then contrast it with the figure I've got at the bottom of that slide, about um, or towards the bottom, about inner London rents actually dropping 15%, then you'll see what a mixed picture the capital has, has had in the past 12 months, and indeed for longer than that. Um, looking at other activities in London, which um, have been very challenging. The average annual house price, um, which clearly is calculated by a number of measures, it's not just investors, it's not just central London, but that house price in 2020 rose by 3.5%, according to UK government figures. Um, now that actually is a pretty decent uh, increase. It's certainly slightly above inflation, and uh, in many years, it would be thought of as being a perfectly respectable figure, but it is significantly less than the house price increase on average throughout the rest of the UK, which was 8.5% last year. And much of that increase, as we'll see, was driven by the tax break I spoke about earlier. The final underlying point about London's market that I want to emphasize is that um, according to Savills, which is um, uh, a research consultancy as well as an agency, but um, it says that central London average prices are now still 21% below their 2014 peak. Now, on the one hand, that of course means good news for investors and good news for anybody who wants to take advantage of those things, but it does show the scale to which some of central London's housing market has been suffering problems for a number of years now. Um, and we'll look at those a little bit later on. But the next slide, if I could get that one, please, is looking at a short term issue which has proven very significant for the UK housing market, including London. Um, the issue is stamp duty. And for people unfamiliar with this UK tax, it's um, a uh, tax to the government which is paid on the vast majority of properties that are purchased. Um, it can be very significant, and that tax has increased enormously in the last 10 years. Um, it is possible for some buyers of some types of properties to pay as much as 18% uh, stamp duty on their properties when they buy. Most people pay a good deal less than that, but any tax break is very significant and has a huge effect on the market. Uh, we've seen already that um, March the 31st is the key date at which the current stamp duty holiday will finish. Now, um, the stamp duty holiday affects properties priced £500,000 and below uh, and applies to almost every buyer. But if it's, an in, if it's an investment property, there is still an additional uh, surcharge for stamp duty that's put on top of that. But it's been a big, big driver, and there's been an absolutely huge increase in the number of um, sales that have been driven by, um, by the stamp duty uh, increase. And I can say that actually some figures that have come in literally in the last half hour 
for the number of sales in January in the UK, there were 121,640 housing transactions in the UK in the one calendar month of January this year. And that actually was 24% higher than a year ago. So that shows the effect of the stamp duty holiday and pushing people to, uh, to purchase. However, there is this uh, uh, cliff edge coming up. If people don't complete their sales by March the 31st, uh, it is likely that some buyers will miss that deadline. Um, anybody who's purchased a property in Britain before will know how slow this process is. And so therefore, um, it's going to be, uh, uh, there will inevitably be quite a few people who will miss this deadline. An estimated 70,000 transactions will. Some of that will lead to fall throughs. People will pull out of their deals. In other cases, there'll be negotiations where sellers and buyers will, I guess, if they're sensible, they'll reach some sort of compromise over um, uh, a buyer paying more than they anticipated, but a seller uh, accepting slightly less in order to compensate for the loss of the stamp duty, um, extent, uh, uh, stamp duty uh, break. Um, there may be an increase in uh, the amount of time given to some buyers. A lot of um, British politicians estate agents, lawyers and analysts are worried about the effect of a so-called cliff edge, a sharp end to the stamp duty holiday. And it seems likely, uh, nobody knows for sure, but it seems likely that on March the 3rd, when uh, the big fiscal statement is made by uh, the UK Treasury in the form of the annual budget, that there may be an extension granted for some buyers. One thing I would also add, which will be of interest to those from overseas who are uh, looking at this webinar, is that um, you probably already know, but from April the 1st, whatever happens about the stamp duty holiday in the UK, uh, non-resident uh, buyers will suffer a, a, an additional 2% surcharge in stamp duty on the entire value of their property. So if they buy something for a million pounds, it's 2% of a million pounds that they will have to pay in, in uh, an additional surcharge. Um, there is also the possibility that the UK will look at the property industry to provide other tax um, increases to cover the huge fiscal black hole that inevitably has happened because of coronavirus. Every country is in this position. The UK is neither better nor worse than others for that. But there are um, certainly there's speculation that there may be other property taxes on their way. And we can perhaps go into that in some of the questions afterwards. Next slide, please. Uh, coronavirus so far, uh, the housing market has completely confounded expectations. At the time um, of the outbreak worldwide of the virus, in roughly this time in 2020, there was the expectation that um, housing transactions would simply you know, stop. And indeed, for uh, about six to eight weeks, the housing market in the UK was closed last spring. But to say the market has confounded expectations would be um, completely underestimating uh, what's happened. Um, it's come back. Uh, the market has been fully open since uh, May last year. Um, the uh, prices, transaction volumes, as I've just shown you, have come back with a vengeance. There's been some indication that some buyers want to move to larger properties, uh, either with their own private open space in the form of gardens or with more public open space like parks. There has been some evidence that this has happened, but actually, rather less than some of the headlines might suggest. Um, and a critical factor to remember is that when everybody is talking about people leaving the city and going to the country, uh, over 95% of people who move property in Britain have to find a buyer before they can move. They cannot afford to move without getting a buyer. So therefore, for every property in a city that's been sold by somebody moving to the country, there's been somebody come in and bought that property. So the total migration flow, which appears by some headlines to be quite large, actually is, it remains to be seen, 
but it's likely to be substantially less influential than some people have been suggesting. Uh, and two other things local to Britain, but um, certainly influential in, boy, in buoying up uh, confidence is the fact that the vaccine rollout in Britain has been faster and more problem free than anybody expected. And as of uh, yesterday, approaching 18 million adults have had their first vaccination. The government has made a commitment that by the end of July this year, all adults in Britain will have had both of their vaccinations, or at least they will have been offered both of their vaccinations. Um, and that puts Britain significantly ahead of most of mainland Europe and many countries in the world. So that gives a level of confidence that is really quite significant and will play into the housing market as it will into all levels of consumer spending. And yesterday's announcements um, regarding the phased reopening of activities in Britain suggests that by June the 21st, most of the major existing restrictions will have ended. Now, the government has been extremely cautious and has been careful to regard itself as being data driven on this. So whilst, of course, it's very difficult to be 100 percent sure what happens with the virus and all of us are in unknown territory to some extent, the government has uh, carved a reputation for itself in recent weeks as being far more cautious than many people would have expected. So I think we can look safely on those dates as being when much of economic activity will resume as uh, something approaching as normal. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, now we look at Brexit. Now, if my mood music over coronavirus was perhaps more optimistic than some people might expect, um, it's probably fair to say that in terms of um, a less predictable impact, um, we have to look at, look at Brexit. Now, it has made some difference already. Um, the trade deal that exists, and I'm sure people around the world have been familiar with the long running saga of Britain negotiating a trade deal with the EU, which is critical to both entities. Uh, the trade deal that was agreed uh, just before New Year does not cover financial services. The critical thing for that is not only is financial services a big sector in its own right, uh, an influential part of the overall UK economy, but it has, um, it provides a huge number of people who fuel London's housing market uh, and including its rental market. Um, so it is a key factor. Now, uh, not covering financial services does is not necessarily a bad thing. There has been a deal uh, and, a, and a formal protocol set up called equivalence, which attempts to protect the uh, financial sectors of both London and the rest of Western Europe in the EU. However, it is difficult to, to say how this will pan out. And uh, within days of Brexit uh, becoming a reality on January the 1st, um, 6 billion uh, euros of daily trading activity shifted from London towards uh, principally Amsterdam, but some to Paris as well. Um, now, that actually is a very small proportion of the overall activity, but clearly there may be some movement of that kind. Um, difficult to predict, uh, and equally many people would say that there would inevitably be greater trade coming in from other parts of the world aside from the EU. So, in other words, this is a big question mark, uh, not necessarily a bad question mark, not necessarily code for a difficulty, but there is a level of uncertainty over what that will mean for London. Um, what has been very good has been that there have been, um, there's effectively there's no issue about um, key London workers that would affect the housing market coming in in some numbers. So people who work in the city, people with highly professional jobs, levels of mobility um, uh, of people coming over for professional jobs uh, is unlikely to be hampered by new visa arrangements. Whether there is the degree of unskilled labor coming in, which provides some of the backbone for London's rental market remains to be seen. That has a bigger question mark. Uh, next slide, please. So, 
time for a little predictions, um, some from me, but more importantly, perhaps from uh, other players in the property market. Um, this year, 2021, there's an expectation that the housing markets throughout the UK, whether you are a buyer, an investor, or a landlord or tenant, um, the housing market is likely to be relatively static. Um, there's been a very strong momentum from the house from the um, stamp duty holiday that has carried over to 2021, but that is likely to slow down during the course of the year. I should caution that absolutely nobody is predicting any significant price falls. Transaction falls over the course of the year are expected to level out. Um, so we are not expecting any significantly bad news. But this will be a relatively quiet year when we look back at Christmas, I believe. However, um, coming back from as the, as the UK economy improves and as the London economy improves in the next few years, so house prices and rental forecasts are also predicting uh, upward movement. You can see there from um, Savills, uh, which is one of the uh, one of the world's um, significant uh, real estate research organisations now, um, that it predicts uh, increases um, for London of one, four, and two percent in successive years from 2022 onwards. Rent forecasts up four, three, and three percent again um, in the next. Uh, four years. Um, London's economy and the UK economy are predicted to uh, expand significantly. They have dropped, uh, London's economy, it is thought, has dropped something in the region of 9% because of coronavirus. The UK economy, depending which figures you look at, uh, has dropped uh, between 7 and 13% over the course of the last 12 months. But um, at its most pessimistic, most of the significant forecasts and forecasters say that the economy will come back by, 20, by the early part of 2023 at the latest. I have to say, I've deliberately taken the slightly more conservative forecasts there. There are some forecasts which suggest that uh, London's economy will be back by mid 2022 to pre-COVID levels and the UK economy slightly earlier than that uh, outside of London. Uh, however, those are, those are key dates to look, after, look for. And I think from an investment perspective, uh, anybody investing who has invested recently or is thinking of investing, there is likely to be some significant growth um, in the next uh, couple of years. One other thing which um, will, will send cheers around the entire capital will be Crossrail, um, Europe's largest uh, transport infrastructure project, which has fallen behind schedule on, to my knowledge, four occasions now, but it is expected to be fully open in 2023. So those are the, um, th that is a, a significant, both a symbolic significance and also means that outer London areas, which currently have good but not great transport links with central London, will suddenly have significantly better transport links with central London. So um, that should trigger uh, greater interest in outer London areas, which sometimes are um, overlooked by the, the, the preoccupation with the centre. Uh, may I have my next and final slide, please? Thank you very much. So um, my conclusion, in conclusion, what I'd like to say is um, that uh, there are long-term characteristics which have been consistent drivers of the housing market in London. Um, and let's start, perhaps I should have put these points in reverse order, but let's start with that bottom point. Uh, according to uh, the Halifax, which is one uh, of a number of quite authoritative measures of the housing market in the UK, since 2010, London house prices have risen 53%, and the north of England, uh, by contrast, has risen only 10%. There is actually a, an additional figure I've been given, not on that slide, but from the UK government, the Office for National Statistics, which show that over that same period, 
2010 to 2020, uh, London prices have risen by 73% uh, over that time. Clearly, uh, house prices can be measured in, in different ways, depending on whether you're looking at average prices, mean prices, and so on. So um, there's inevitably um, uh, a variation over that. But what I think is crystal clear is that London as an investment has been um, solid over the last 10 years. And that's notwithstanding the repercussions in, in 2010 and around then, at the end of the global financial crisis, the build up to that time, the trauma that Britain has had uh, for three or four years about Brexit and leaving the EU, which depressed uh, a little bit of broad economic activity, but certainly depressed property investment in areas like London. And yet, despite all that, London's capital appreciation has been very significant. Add on top of that the enduring characteristics which draw people to London, um, culture, education, language, connectivity, uh, education in particular. There are some new figures out again in the past week which show that um, the level of uh, Chinese student um, uh, bookings for the UK have increased by over 20% in the last three years. Um, uh, the, that is a, a key factor for a lot of education, oh, sorry, for a lot of the housing market at the higher end around uh, London's various educational um, institutions. Uh, as we've already said, there's significant infrastructure projects in London. There's the High Speed 2 rail link, which comes from London and is going to the north of England. There is Crossrail that we've spoken about. City Airport, which people will be familiar with, it's the um, smaller of London airports, but it's right in the um, in the heart of the capital. Uh, that has an expansion program, which it says it will continue with, um, despite the uh, difficulties that aviation has had in recent uh, months. And um, there continues to be a relative housing shortage compared to demand in London and across the rest of the UK. And there's a high proportion of people uh, renting around 38% of all London households now are in the private rented sector. That's twice as large as it is in the rest of the UK with no indication of um, that changing in the near future. Um, and finally, and I suppose critically for what we're talking about here, uh, London has long had a reputation as a safe haven for investment. It's a stable political and economic uh, landscape and it continues to uh, show relatively good returns. Nobody can say that that's going to happen forever. Nobody can say there's not going to be some hiccups, uh, hence my um, reputation as giving this unbiased view. However, London remains uh, almost unarguably the main investment location for the UK for housing. Uh, so with that, I will hand back to Mark and I'll look forward to answering some questions. Thank you very much, Graham. That was so interesting. And if actually it's led to an awful lot of additional questions, it makes me personally feel so positive on the market. So actually, thank you, even at these difficult times. Um, as I said at the beginning, Graham and I are going to be answering any questions, or as many questions as we, as we can. Um, just before we do that, I want to share how we as a business, Benham and Reeves are finding the market. All our branches were open throughout all of the lockdowns because there have been multiple in London. And in fact, have been, we've been surprisingly busy. We agreed more sales in 2020 than we did in 2019. And we let the same number of properties in 2020 as we did in 2019. So, you know, supporting what, what Graham said from, a, from, a, from an overseas level, we didn't see evidence of the mass exodus, which was so widely reported. Um, as, as Graham mentioned, you know, we did see rents soften and, and that was anywhere from seven to 15%. But again, I agree with Graham that this is a temporary um, dip in the market and the positive vaccine news will see a quick return to normality and rental prices will return. And a few people have asked questions about when rental prices will return to normal and can I jack the rent up? This is not the time, but we do foresee a mini boom for rentals towards the end of the year. Um, 
I'd like to share that one of the key things I always advise everyone to bear in mind is what tenants actually want. You know, when you're renting a property, when you own an investment property or you're buying, um, you need to think about what your occupier is going to want. And we, we conduct regular surveys of our 3000 tenants. Um, and the last one we did was in quarter four last year. And it was really interesting. It showed that some things never change, you know, location, location, location. You know, Graham said London is, is, the, is the epicenter in the UK for investment. And so location was still really important. Families do want to be near good schools and near to parks and public gardens. So if you're getting larger properties or, or smaller houses that are going to appeal to families, then these are things to take into account. Um, interestingly, in the survey, closeness to transport links dropped a couple of places because I think more people were working from home. That became less of an, inc uh, an important driver. But I think as we come out of the of, of lockdown. I think you'll see that return as a primary and important consideration for tenants. And with Crossrail coming on in 2023, I was hoping it was going to be the end of this year, but it is increasingly looking like it's going to be the end of 2022, beginning of 2023. You know, that's really important. But COVID itself has created new trends. Working from home led to increased importance placed on space for desks, super fast broadband. Um, and more important than ever was demand for private outside space. The number of tenants that told us they wanted a balcony because they wanted to open the door in the day when they're working from home, and especially if it's warm, if it's, we've had some warm weather. Um, that's been really important. And these trends we think are going are gonna to feature for the long term. So it's really important to bear this in mind. And coupled with the return to normality, there are good investment opportunities out there. But it's more important than ever that you plan meticulously. You get real on the ground knowledge from webinars like this, from, from agents like ourselves. And you use a trusted, independent partner that's going to hold your hand and help you or give you advice when you need it. And, and I genuinely feel that's where we as a business come in. Um, and with so many new attendees today, I know some of you already know who we are and some of you are clients who've, who have who kindly join us, but I, but I just wanted to give, just very briefly tell you a bit about Benham and Reeves in case you don't know us and how we can help. Essentially, we're an investor's agent. Because of what Benham and Reeves do, which is, in a word, is everything property related, um, to support clients throughout the process. You know, we've been established since 1958. Obviously, I haven't been there since 1958, but the business has. And today we have 26 branches globally. Um, we've been very busy, as I said, and even during lockdown, even during lockdown, we managed to open two brand new branches, one in Woolwich and one in White City. So we've now got 18 across London and internationally we're in China. We have Hong Kong, Singapore, du uh, KL in Malaysia, Dubai, and three offices in India, all there to service our clients. And, you know, well, there are international branches are there with the sole responsibility to support clients through the journey, giving advice, genuine, honest advice, and then handheld, handhold throughout the whole process. And the process that we're there to help with, unlike a lot of our competitors, we're there to help you with everything. And that includes handover and snagging. And then furnishings and refurbishment, to letting, to rent collection, to property management and even dealing with tax returns. So whether you have any tax to pay or you don't have tax to pay, you have to do a return and we're there to help you. We naturally also do sales, but that's not just brand new off-plan sales like lots of agents do in Asia. We'll help with assignments. That means if you bought something off-plan and you don't want to complete or can't afford to complete, um, then we can help you sell prior to completion. And of course, we also do uh, secondhand sales. Um, it's really important to mention that everything we do is done in-house. Nothing is subcontracted, so we never get let down. And in turn, we never have to let a client down. And that includes furnishings. Um, we set up Instyle Direct almost 20 years ago to offer clients a complete one-stop hassle-free service. And here's a couple of examples showing the Instyle effect, as I call it, with before and after pics. You know, so much so that even during lockdown, 
even during lockdown, 70% of the properties that Instar furnish let within seven days. So I wanted to end by mentioning one of our unique differences. One of the things that at Benham and Reeves we do differently from almost everybody else is that we, and that's our directors and our senior members of our team who've been with us a long time, often invest alongside our clients in the same developments and locations where we put our money into the market in the same places we recommend, which clearly demonstrates our strong belief in the London market and whatever we clearly recommend. So that's enough from me talking about us. I mean, I hope that's given you an overview. If you've got any more questions um, about that, then I'm happy to ask. So, so now Graham and I are going to answer, well, try and answer as many questions as we can. Um, if we don't get round to them, then you can feel easy that we'll, you can feel safe that we'll, we'll be in touch and give answers, or you can chase me by email and answer a question. So Graham, there've been quite a few questions about stamp duty and, um, and, and taxes to be fair, but stamp duty is the most important one that, that a few people have asked. Um, and the first question is, is, do you think that the stamp duty will be extended post 31st of March? And I know you touched on it, but, but maybe you want to just quickly say that. Yeah, I think it will be extended, but only for buyers who are already um, quite a significant way through the purchase process. Um, I think the government wants to avoid a situation whereby as many as we've, we've said, it could be 70,000, some people predict far more than that, uh, purchasers who um, started their transaction many, many months ago, but because of the slowness of the transaction process, they haven't been able to complete in time. I think that would be bad publicity. And I think the government genuinely thinks that's probably going to be unfair. So although there has been no decision yet, my feeling is that they will try to make sure that everybody who is already a long way down the road will get their stamp duty um, uh, exemption. However, there are other taxes, and I know there are some other questions about other taxes. So let me briefly say uh, what there are. Absolutely no decisions have been made by the government on this, but we do know for sure the government is looking at changing capital gains tax to make it uh, more comparable with UK income tax. Um, so far as investors, and what that would mean is that when they come to sell their properties, there may be a higher level of, not, not um, this isn't currently the case, but it may happen that there will be higher levels of capital gains tax on the profit that people make when they sell. The greater the appreciation, the greater the tax. That's clearly... Um, that's, on, that's, only, that's only in consultation. They haven't had any decisions on that. And, and to be fair, we don't know. And, and, and one thing I would add to that is if you look at a lot of other parts of the world, the taxes there are a lot higher on exit. So, I mean, yeah. we don't know that yet. So, I mean, I think, I think we, we, it may come in, but it'll come in for UK residents um, only if that does come in. I've, another couple of, a couple of people have asked, you know, do we think that the UK government or, or are going to start focusing on overseas buyers to try and get more tax out of them? I, I genuinely feel the additional stamp duty that they're bringing on the 1st of April is the only thing that's going to come. And I think everything after that will, if they do tax, will be taxing UK residents as well as overseas buyers. I don't think you're going to see um, overseas buyers get penalised. Yeah. It's probably just worth adding there, Mark, that actually the UK uh, at the moment, the, the political mood music is to try to show that the UK is as international as possible because some people have said that Brexit suggests otherwise. And so I think I, think I would agree with you that uh, whilst we don't know for sure, it's unlikely there will be any more restrictions or uh, taxations on overseas buyers. I agree. OK, that's great. Um, a few people have asked about the stamp duty. So as Graham said, we, we, we think if you have, if, if, if you are, if, if, if it's in the process at the moment, we're pretty sure Rishi's going to, um, as long as it's in lawyer's hands, he's going to give an extension. And I hope it's going to be six months, but we don't know. We're going to see on the 8th of March, but I'm pretty sure they're going to do that. The only thing this is not going to affect is the additional 2% for overseas bars. You will have had to complete by the 1st of April. If you have not completed by the 1st of April, that 2% is going to come in. 
And so you need to be prepared for that um, um, to happen. So um, that's, that's really important to bear in mind. Um, another good question that I've had um, is, um, is do we expect the, the, the rents in central London are gonna bounce back given the fact that rents in outer areas have, 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 have obviously been much stronger? Um, I think, yes, they will. Um, uh, I think that will be determined um, quite significantly by things like international travel. Um, and by that, I mean that the supply of rental property in central London and indeed elsewhere, but central London quite acutely. That supply has been increased significantly in recent months because people with Airbnb and other short let platform uh, flats and houses have uh, obviously had no clients at all. So they have uh, shifted their stock over, in some cases back to longer term renting. I think once international travel resumes, holiday resumes, the vaccine uh, good feeling exists um, uh, around much of the Western world, then I think uh, we'll see some of those properties move back into the short let sector. Supply will reduce, demand will probably increase a little bit in, as, and that will, will probably mean good news for rents. No, and I, I totally agree with that. I think, I think you're gonna see as more people come in, one of the two factors that, that really affected the, into the, the rental market was lack of international students because of the restriction in travel and obviously COVID in the UK, uh, we had about an 85% drop in student numbers this summer. So that, that meant there were not so many people looking for rentals. Number two, Airbnb was absolutely decimated. So a lot of people that were letting their flats on short term put that property in the market. So there was a lot of additional supply um, and obviously reduced numbers. So that had an effect. You know, a couple of people have asked is our international students going to come back? Obviously, we don't know, but the vaccine rollout here, you know, as Graham said, 18 million people. Um, we're pretty confident by with the rollout he announced, uh, the, the, the prime minister announced last night that we're going to see, you know, pretty much normality by um, by October with students returning. So I think you'll see students come back into the market. And, and I think that will genuinely think that will lead to a mini boom in the rental market. I'm not talking rents jump 25%. I'm talking about a mini boom with strong demand in the student market who are going to look to get accommodation. So, so that's that. Um, the next question um, that, that I had, which is actually quite interesting, a couple of people asked on capital gains, I think because you just mentioned on that, is how does the government assess capital gains tax on poor properties, for example, bought in 1995 and sold in 2021? Do you want to take, or do you want me to take that, or do you want to take that? Um, take well, that well, currently, I mean, um, this this obviously is a is a um, one driving reason why the government may want to look on on this is that um, any property that was bought, say, twenty five years ago, will have very significant capital appreciation wherever it is in the country, but particularly in London, as we've seen, uh, and therefore um, to try to capture some um, tax from that profit um, and a greater chunk of tax than before is obviously of, of huge appeal uh, to the government. Um, however, uh, without being too glib about it, um, I think we all know that, there, you know that there's an industry that goes on to try to reduce tax liability for investors. Uh, we, all, we all know of accountants, financial advisors and so on and so forth. Um, so it is unlikely that um, there will not be new paths to um, exemptions and to um, optimizing tax positions for investors. But certainly capital gains tax appears to be, according to the mood music and informed speculation, capital gains tax is likely to be the favored tax increase um, over the next few years. But, uh, but I, think, I think the thing to, to look at that is, if I'm honest, since 2008, so the law changed for those of you that don't know that up until 2015, there was no, no capital gains tax for overseas buyers. So London was a fantastic market. That came in in 2015. But properties that had owned previously that could be revalued from a 2015 price point. Mm. I think there will have been little growth from 2015 to 2021, unless you're very lucky. And um, so therefore, I, I don't think the tax payable will be too high. And as I said earlier, it's not come in yet. 
Um, here's an interesting question. Um, one of one of our clients has just asked this because I see his name, Bob. Savills are predicting 4% growth in 2023. That's what Graham said, yep. but only 2% in 2024 in all London. Do you agree with that? And, and, and why the not such strong growth in 2024? Well, let me let me let you into a secret. We get, as journalists, and I'm sure as investors or companies or consultancies and other agents, get um, sometimes get an extraordinary amount of detail in terms of forecasts, sometimes predicting right down to the, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, second decimal point as to what an increase will be. And I find that very difficult to take too seriously. I think the, I think the broad message of an increase is one I would take seriously. And likewise, if they said a decrease, I would take that seriously. But to be able to predict precise figures, uh, firstly, I, in answer to that question, I don't know why they're saying one year is slightly less than another. But also, I think, you know, we've had great difficulty, um, you know, knowing even when the vaccine is going to roll out, and we've had great difficulty knowing all sorts of other influential factors for the housing market. So from without wanting to duck that answer, my advice has always been, and always is, for people to look at the broad direction of travel of the majority of these forecasts, rather than the figure to the precise decimal point and try to hold them to account on that. Good, I, 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 I mean, my view is, is actually we're gonna see pretty flat prices this year. We're gonna see a decent increase next year and then you'll see a flat upwardly trajectory. I don't know why some of us have this different, but I think it's maybe so people ask the question more than anything else. Um, one thing a few people have asked is, because obviously we talked about right in the center and going further out, um, is, is what's the difference? You know, how far does inner London extend? You know, and, and what are the real differences between right in the center and further out? And, and where, and then the next thing on the back of that is where do we see better yields and better possibilities in returns or, or predicted returns? Um, well, uh, in terms of definitions, actually, I think probably every consultancy and analyst has got a slightly different definition. I think, broadly speaking, most people would agree that if you look at the centre point of, um, of uh, London, around about Westminster, and you look at the 12 boroughs of London that surround that, that that constitutes central London um, in, in, a, in a broad sense. And those areas uh, within the M25 but outside of those 12 central boroughs, they constitute outer London. And most definitions roughly coincide with that. Um, the reason that uh, I think that outer London may perform better is that, is that there are still some question marks, as we said, over central London. Uh, Brexit is a question mark. Uh, I suppose um, uh, the precise degree to which people return to offices remains a question mark. Um, and uh, obviously, um, central London has very high entry prices. So um, that combined with the transport improvements, particularly Crossrail, makes me believe that uh, outer London may give the greater investment opportunities and give the greater yields. They're going to have lower entry prices. And so therefore, it's likely you'll get greater yields because the capital value difference between central London and outer London is greater than the rental difference between inner London and outer London. So I think you, you may, in general, get higher yields from outer London. I, I, I mean, we concur. I mean, we, we totally see that. We've seen that the lower capital values, there are lots and lots of people looking in the outer zones, zones three, zone four, zone five, and even further out, you know, Hayes and, 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 and further out areas are seeing such strong rental demand and therefore rents have been very good in these areas we have a new development in northwest london which came online last month we had seven instructions they were all gone within a week i mean it's really strong and and most of them are the asking rents and we've got a new development coming in Southall, not far from heathrow airport we had a flat complete on friday we had an asking price offer yesterday i mean the market for lower value units is incredibly strong. And that's because that's where local people uh, affordability comes in. So that's interesting. In fact, on the back of that, we've had, a, we've had another question 
um, about what would be the best time, do you think, to sell large properties, you know, in West London in an area with, the, say, Crossrail and good transport links? Or is it better to hold it and let it? Um, well, if you put a gun to my head to answer that question, I would say uh, hold it for a few years, let uh, Crossrail be completely finished and open, and for uh, any residue of uh, reluctance in office opening and so on and so forth uh, from the virus to have got out of the way. So I would say um, let it until, um, say, three years' time, and then if the market is, is, is helpful, and I think it will be, then that will be a better time to sell. I, I, I must say I agree with that. There's, have, the only thing I would say is that there has been a huge shift in, as we talked about working from home and people needing outside space, to slightly further out. So you find the house market on, on the periphery of London and in fact in the country has been very strong. So if you have a decent house for a family, you're going to get it. You, you will get a fair price now. But, but, but my view always would be is to hold it and rent it for two, three years, let everything calm down, everything return to normality. And then I think that'll be the best time to exit. That, that's just my view, as you said. Um, um, is um, Another question someone asked is, do we think that that CGT will come in on, on people's own homes or just on investments? Because a lot of people, a lot of our clients own properties in the UK that they let their children stay in. So do you think that yeah. will be affected? Um, uh, it, I think at that point, the issue becomes more political than fiscal, if you know what I mean. I mean, yeah. clearly, already capital gains tax on investment properties, second homes and holiday homes and so on. Um, and I think there is a cultural acceptance of that. And one can argue whether it should be greater or less, but I think there's an acceptance. I think there is a there will be a huge political difficulty for the government to introduce capital gains tax on principal homes, um, partly because um, the party in government, the Conservative Party in the UK, has a tradition of uh, home ownership and pushing home ownership. Um, secondly, it uh, also it has, uh, broadly speaking, uh, a more affluent um, supporter base, and they would be the people who would be hit by this. Uh, and also, um, there's been a, a cultural um, acceptance that uh, about inheritance, there's been a cultural acceptance about sometimes having larger properties which can be downsized in order to free money for later life and so on, uh, increasingly the case with the costs of social care for older people. So it's going to be very, very difficult politically for the government to tell people that when they sell their principal home, they're going to be walloped with a big tax. Great. I think, yeah, I... I agree. We don't like talking about walloping with any form of taxes, but sadly, it's a nature and with everything that's happened, mm. we're going to have to pay some taxes. But it's still such a good, stable investment in property. Let, let's be honest, the fundamentals for London property will remain the same. It's still going to be a capital centre. Um, and, um, and there's lots of people working from here, even with Brexit, which actually I've not seen a single question. Well, there's one question on Brexit. You know, let's be honest with Brexit. You know, there may be visas, but let's be honest, anybody coming from the US, from, from other parts of the world to work in the UK, they need visas now anyway, and companies can easily get those. So anybody coming from Europe, they're just going to need to go through the same process and there's no problem. Do you, do you think that on Brexit? Because yeah. there was yeah. one, I think. Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, the, I mean that, that I think that has longer uncertainty and I'm, I, I'm not um, being euphemistic. I'm not being coy with my words here. I think it's uncertain. That doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be bad, but it's got more uncertainty than coronavirus, actually, because we know that that's going to, um, uh, there's going to be an end to that over the next two or three years at worst in terms of any impact at all, and the economy will recover. I think the economy may change shape because of Brexit. Clearly, there's going to be new trading partners, whereas now we may have a lot of Europeans who work in, say, the city of London, there may be more international workers from outside of Europe. So things will change, but not necessarily for the worse, so far as the housing market is concerned. That, that's interesting. In fact, on the back of that, a lot, a couple of people have asked, in fact, a few people have asked about, we talk about London a lot, is, is 
What about other cities like Birmingham, Manchester? And, you know, I'll just, you know, my view on that is, is 100% there's lots going on in both those cities, but London is the capital city. And that's where everything really is happening. Yes, Manchester and Birmingham and Liverpool to an extent are, are good independent markets, but there's becoming increasing oversupply there. And a lot of, a lot of, our clients look at that because of the lower capital value, but then they they turn and they look at London and actually the differential, it becomes quite, quite limited when you look between the price in Manchester now and price in zone five in London, the price difference isn't so much. And where would you rather buy in the capital city or someone further away? So that, that's my view, but but Graham, maybe you've got one on, over, on, on outside. Well, I, th I think the, there's an element of, of the economic perspective as well. Um, I mean, clearly it's, it's much cheaper to buy in Birmingham than it is to buy in London, um, but, um, even though there's going to be a high speed rail link, for example, is there going to be a significant movement of businesses, of economy, of uh, wealth generation from London to Birmingham? There's actually no discussion about that at all. So although, although, although there may be, it may be much faster to get there by train from London, there's not actually any suggestion that that, uh, that will be generating more jobs. In fact, most of the discussion is about greater transport and the improvement in the infrastructure in the other direction towards London rather than out of it. So some of the infrastructure improvements we're, we're seeing are likely to be like that. And you're already hearing, um, you, you know, it is highly unlikely that London is going to stop being the center of so much that goes on. There's actually a perfectly good case for criticizing that London that, that the UK is as centralised as it is, and compared to other countries, it's much more centralised. But that doesn't alter the fact that London is that centre and is unlikely to shift in the near future. I, I think I, I 100%. That's what I'm based, and I would only buy in London. But it depends what your, your interest is and why you buy, I suppose. But, but from an investment perspective, I'd rather be in the capital. Um, um, a couple of people have asked, um, again, about stamp duty and when it's going to come in. And there have been loads and loads of questions on stamp duty. So what I would say on stamp duty, if you've got a question, feel free to email me, mark at benhams.com. That's mark with a C at benhams.com. I'll try to respond to you and I'll speak to Graham and come back. Um, one question a couple of people have asked, because it is a big thing, it's been in the news, is about cladding and fire issues, you know. What, what are your predictions going to happen with that? Because obviously it's affecting sales times with the EWS1 forms. Yeah. What is your view on that? Um, well, uh, well, the view, I think, of any upstanding, decent person is that it's a, com it's a complete scandal. No, no, um, wherever one stands as to, as to the responsibility for it, the reality is that um, private house builders are not they are, you know, so long as they uh, were abiding by the legislation at the time these properties were built, then they do not have a responsibility. And I doubt that you will really be able to persuade them to spend substantial amounts on changing the cladding. The work that's involved is clearly too expensive for the um, for the individual property owners, leaseholders to uh, afford. Um, and arguably it's wrong that they should be expected to anyway. And um, so I think it will ultimately fall on the government. Now, as we know, or as, as many people who are watching this may know, there has recently been um, uh, the uh, proposal that there will be a levy on some new build properties to um, contribute towards remedy adding. Wow. Um, but I think, uh, but firstly, that's not, on, not to remedy the entire position and secondly i don't think it's going to be anything like the sufficient amount of money so i think the government will ultimately have to address this problem but i mean clearly it is you know it is a long-term issue it's going to be around for a few years what i think is critical is that the government is already beginning to make the, those properties sellable again that's from the housing market point of view and from other people's point of view, the important thing is that they become sellable and mortgageable. And uh, the government is making some inroads into that, but I think probably not enough and not quickly enough. OK, fine. I mean, we're, we're, it's just gone 11 o'clock, so I think I've still got so many questions coming in and there's still a lot of you with us. So I hope you don't mind. We're going to run on for another yeah. five or so minutes um, and I hope everybody doesn't 
doesn't mind. If you do need to leave and have any questions, as I said, drop us an email. Um, one person asked a question, which is quite good. We're talking about taxes. How do you establish the price of a property in 2015 for tax purposes for capital gains tax? So it's all self-declared, but if the gain is, if HMRC declare the gain would be more than you would do, you don't want to have an argument. So our advice all the way through is to get a surveyor to do an independent valuation for you. If you, if you have a property that's managed by us or let by us, we have um, a surveyor that's done, well, a few surveyors that have done a lot of the valuations for us. We did about 1,500 a few years back. So if you need it, we can still do it now. So that, that, that's, that's very important, and I would recommend that. Um, this is an interesting question, um, Graham. If you are to buy today, which part of London or which area approximately would you buy for capital growth over a five-year period? I mean, I know that's the crystal ball question, but it's quite a few people want to know what your advice is, where they should be buying. Should I it be so someone else said, should I be buying on the river or should I be buying, you know, so let's hear what your view is. My, my um, I'm, I'm by no means, I, I think, Mark, you're going to be infinitely better informed about this than I am. But my judgment would be I would buy in outer West London because um, it's playing to the strengths of the way London has been. Much of the um, much of the uh, capital infrastructure will, and and the changes with Crossrail will mean that West London becomes much more um, readily connected with the city than it has been in the past. It will be much quicker to get to Canary Wharf and elsewhere from the Actons, the Ealings, the further out west from that. Uh, it remains to be um, a, a major. Uh, sort of road area in terms of access to the m25 access to key roads especially to the west it's um significant in terms of uh, of course uh, heathrow airport which will come back as air travel will in terms of being a very significant factor and even on a more sociable basis if you like it's um uh, key for people wanting to get away to the west of England, which is a pop for those who don't know, is a popular um, uh, holiday home vacation location. So um, I think that there's there always has been actually a lot to be said for that, and I think there probably always will be a lot to be said for that area. So Graham's a big West London fan, and I'm going to go I'm going to go opposite to that. In fact, I'm going to include that. My honest view is is, and there've been lots of questions here about, is buy to let investment still a good thing? Should I enter the market now? Should I wait? The reality is, is so number one on, is it a good investment? I still believe it's a great investment. And I think it's a good long-term, it's a stable investment. Yes, we have these ups and downs, which we have at the moment with rents being subdued a bit, but you still get income. At least there's still people renting. So please bear that in mind. If you have a property and, it's priced correctly, it will rent. It's all about price. And in terms of the location and where you'd buy, frankly, I agree with Graham. I think outside of the central zone, uh, the, the main inner London, if you look at the outer zones, whether that's in West London, and I like West London a lot, or you look in some of the Southwest, you know, and you can get some very, very interesting um, opportunities closer in in Southwest London, like, like if you look at at, um, at where Elephant and Castle is. That's still zone one, and there are some interesting interesting things there. And again, in the east, I hate to not put a, put, a, put a point on it, but I think in the east, there are interesting things happening where Stratford is. There are low, you know, London is such a myriad. There are 32 boroughs. There are so many different things going on in different areas. So I would, you know, it's good to pick where you like. So if you like West London, look there and just use somebody who's going to give you honest advice of where it's going to rent. But, but as I said, I mean, I like West London. It's done incredibly well, but so is Northwest, Southwest, Southeast, and in the East. So further out. Um, another, another question that I've had here is, is uh, I, I mean, I, I have a child coming to London to study. Can I buy in his name? He's over 18 and what taxes are to pay? So, you know, just a quick answer to that is, is, Yes, you can buy in their name over 18. Yes, they can get a mortgage, a loan if you want them to, but you'll obviously have to back it because they're studying. Um, the taxes you pay will just be the stamp duty to go in. And if it's his own home, so you buy in his name and it's his own home and he lives there, when he comes to sell, there'll be no capital gains because it's 
primary residence. So actually, it's a quite a good thing to do. And lots of our clients do that. And in fact, one of my favorite stories when, I, when I'm lucky enough to do overseas talks, which obviously this year has not, is one of my favorite stories. We have a Malaysian couple that bought a property in London for their, for their son to live in. He lived in it. Um, the first year we rented it because he didn't want to live in it and wanted to be in halls with his friends. He then stayed in it for the three years while he was doing his medicine degree. Then, and we rented it for a couple of years after. So they owned it for a six year period. And when they sold it, notwithstanding this was four years ago or four years ago when they sold, their capital gain and their profit was enough not only to cover all his his accommodation, because clearly they were there. It also covered the entire cost of his degree. And uh, and the only thing that always makes me laugh is when I when I met them after the time, you see, the wife always said, oh, I'm always slightly nervous. But of course, when they saw the profit, she said to her husband, I'll never forget this. I told you we should have bought two. And you should see the face between them. But, but the reality is London is a good long term. I can't guarantee returns like that, but it's a very good, stable investment strategy. So we still buy it. I've still bought myself. And, you know, looking at what areas to buy in, you know, personally, I bought a flat this year in Southall, which is near the airport. Graham just mentioned it, near Heathrow Airport. 76,000 people work at Heathrow, and a lot of them do rent. Plus, it's on the Crossrail line, which we're talking about coming in 2022-23. Um, I think that has a lot of advantages. So that, that's, that's just, you know, my view. But yeah, 100% someone can study. Um, another question here, which I think is quite, quite interesting. Um, Graham, you might have a view on this. What's the future for flats in traditional buildings, you know, Georgian, etc., but with a walk-up among the boom of new builds with lifts? Um, well, I mean, clearly there's, there's been an enduring demand for people to have period properties, and London is fortunate in having so many quite often fantastic period properties uh, throughout the capital and throughout almost every borough. There's, there's plenty of it. And so there will be always demand for that. Um, from an investment point of view, I'm conscious of the fact that I have a lot of information coming to me as a journalist about um, energy efficiency and changes and expectations about uh, forthcoming law changes to have a higher, better rated uh, energy performance certificates on properties and so on. Now, there's no guarantee that every modern property is going to be a good performer in that way. But clearly, modern properties either have better energy efficiency in them, or it's probably easier to retrofit uh, good energy efficiency in it. So that isn't the only factor that people look for. And of course, there are lots of other economic factors that we've discussed at length. But it strikes me as an investment that uh, is becoming increasingly on the government's agenda that things need to have um, high energy efficiency and more modern properties are probably easier to meet those requirements than older ones. Okay, great, um, great. Um, and I agree with that. Actually, you know, to be fair, a fourth floor walker for a three bedroom flat, today people don't want that anymore. So you can get it, but it's all price driven. You know, if the rent is low enough or the capital price is low enough, anything will sell equal you know just like that room that sold you know six by six square foot room that sold for two hundred thousand pounds in mayfair things will sell it's all depending on price but today's tenants tend to like newer buildings and they tend to want things like a concierge i talked about our survey concierge or porter or on-site help is very important when tenants are looking this is actually quite an interesting question um, do you think the long term trend is that cities may lose their shine despite advantages of living in a city because by definition they're overcrowded and in view of any future pandemics? That's an interesting question. Well, um, I think, I mean, yes, they might. Um, it, it depends. I mean, people, people have spoken in the past about all sorts of things. Uh, losing their impetus. I mean, one big global example you can look on, I mean, I know it's in one specific city, but it got global attention was, of course, the terrible events of 9-11. And a lot of people are thinking, well, this is it. New York has finished. Manhattan has finished. Tall towers have finished. And uh, what have we seen in the intervening 20 years? Well, until the pandemic changed um, 
things in 2020. There were more tall towers built. Manhattan didn't lose its uh, it didn't lose population, and New York has remained the business center it was. So um, it's easy, um, and I, it's not necessarily wrong, but it's easy to look now and think what has dominated our lives for the last 12 months will be an enduring factor. It may well be in five years' time, people will think, you know, I like the social life that cities bring with it. I like the architecture. I like working in offices because it means Thursday evening is the new Friday evening and I go out for a drink with people and everything else. That may well be that cities will not suffer a fundamental change. It may happen, I think, that people will want more green space. Future planning of cities might have more green space, but I don't think cities are a dead duck. I, I, I totally agree. Let's be honest, you don't just live in, in London in order for commuting times. People, you know, there are, there are, you, can, you can move slightly further out and with Crossroad coming, commuting in is going to be very interesting. But people have an emotional tie to where they live. They like the restaurants, the cinema, the, the not cinema, the theatres. You know, everything that happens within London is why people want to live in our, London. And I, I, I love that, what Graham said about post 9-11. Hideous as it was, there was reports in the papers it was the end of urbanisation. And, and Graham said in the last 20 years, actually in the five years following 9-11, there were more towers built than had ever been bought, be, be built before. And so we, I don't see it. Of course, there'll be people working from home and, and work ethics will change and work, work procedures will change. But, but I don't think it's the, I certainly don't think it'll be the end of cities. Um, I think this is the last question um, and it is quite interesting. There are a few companies offering investment funds with a targeted return of eight to 12% um, under, with, the, with the developer protecting it. Would you would you buy something like that? Is that good advice to buy something with? I mean, frankly, for me, with such high yields, what do you think, Graham? Um, well, uh, again, without being glib, the old phrase: if it if it um, if it looks too good to be true, that's uh, there's often a reason why it looks too good to be true. Um, it's it's very very difficult to get those scale of yields. I mean, let's be honest about it. If there's a guaranteed rent return, it's typically the case that there is a guaranteed rent return because that has been built into the purchase price to begin with. If there's um, some sort of long-term yield uh, pledged, then that is being funded. The, the people organizing this are not charitable institutions for the sake of investors. They are there to make funds themselves. Um, and there's also the unpredictability over some funds, and I'm not going to go into individual details, but we're probably all aware that some funds have not performed as well as their predictions. And even with apparent guarantees and even with apparent legal security for some investors, some of those funds have, um, with a lot of publicity in the last few years, they've, they've effectively been halted. So um, it's not, in my opinion, it's by, there is no firm guarantee on investments, irrespective of what is said at, at, the, at the purchase stage. 100%. I mean, student accommodation is the big one. Everybody goes on and on and on about how fantastic it is. And don't get me wrong, it's not, no, it's great. If you buy a student room and you can enter from as low as £50,000, but it's cash with no finance and you might get 10%. But how do you exit? The good thing with buying a property, and especially a London property, there are always buyers, whether that's UK buyers or overseas buyers, there are always buyers in the market. And and someone asked the question, what's our percentage of, of foreign buyers at the moment to local buyers? Well, honestly, it's probably 75% are local buyers now of secondhand stock because this is people buying for their own homes. There are a few investors, but primarily this is people buying to live in. You know, remember, as Graham said right at the beginning, people need homes and the process takes time. So if they cannot most people would not own their own home and then buy something off plan um because they have to move they use that capital to move they're not investors so that means they don't buy off for, as, as far off of in advance as as our clients overseas do that's why you know if uk people buy they tend to have to buy within a small window mortgages in the uk or loans only last for three to six months so I can't buy something today that's going to complete in two years time because I can't get a loan. I don't know where I'll be. So most UK buyers will buy something if it's for their own home 
that's completing in three to six months or already completed. So that's why so many UK buyers, but there's still lots of developments going on. And, and my last question, because I we have overrun by 20 minutes and I'm really sorry, is there's been so much negative press. Oh, here it is. The Guardian has a report recently talking very negatively about Nine Elms um, as an area. What would your reaction and response be? I'm going to let Graham answer that, but I'm just going to quickly say um, that we have an office in Nine Elms and it is one of our busiest. We run on so little stock. It's like Canary Wharf where there's so many tenants, but we just don't have enough stock. And, and so for me, it lets incredibly well. And I think you'll see decent capital values with so much going on. But, but Graham, you want to answer that? And this is our last, so I'm sorry for holding you up. Thank but, you. No, at all. The, um, well, there are always two issues of big, big developments, whether it's Nine Elms or, or elsewhere. And clearly Nine Elms is, is one, of, one of the very largest. Uh, there are two, always two issues there, in fact. Firstly, does a lot of stock come on the market at the same time? Now, because a development is large and takes many years in the case of Nine Elms uh, and has a number of different facets to it, it doesn't necessarily mean that a lot of properties come on the market at the same time. I mean, I've, I've known much smaller locations in provincial cities in Britain where suddenly, uh, for various reasons, often to do with the cash flow of the developer, they have waited and they have put 200 apartments on the market at the same time. And that's almost completely sunk the local market in that small provincial town centre, um, but that doesn't mean that if it's a more if it's in a, such a large landscape as London, and it's a phased increase in property that's on on the market, doesn't have to have that effect. The second thing to take into account, we haven't seen it. I think I believe at Nine Elms, but there have been some other developments in London. Is the long term funding of the individual developer um, and whether that continues, but that's in a way that all that does if there is a problem with that it just increases the duration of the build time and which actually is sometimes better for the market than getting a large number at one time so um that i, I think that's probably not quite answering the question not because i'm ducking it but because i don't know nine elms with 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 uh, as intimately as maybe mark does but um there's nothing essentially wrong with a very large scale development providing it's a phased uh, build out of units. I, I agree. I mean, the thing with nine elms. I mean, I am going to finish um, um, because we have run over. But there are. I can't believe how many questions are still coming in now. Um, but the thing I would say about nine elms is there are lots of different developers. It's not one central master plan developers. You've got lots of different developers. So you've got Battersea Power Station at the west end. You've got all the way up to St George Wharf, where where which is built by Barclay at the other end. And, and all, this, all the stock in between. So from a rental perspective, it's done very well. There is a lot of stock. Don't get with standing. There's 28,000 new homes coming in total. That's a lot. But if we run short in the UK of 350,000 homes a year, you know, 28,000, that's under 10%. I know it's in a concentrated area, but, but the proof has been in the pudding. We have not seen rents down by 50, 60%. We have not seen capital prices dropping through the floor. And so my view is it's a good area. It's zone one. It has the Northern Line extension coming through it. So frankly, I think it's a good area. But, but as I said, I'm, I, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Graham for joining us That's today. Cool. Thank you. And thank you so much for so many of you staying with us for an hour and 20 minutes. And I'm really sorry we've overrun, but I hope it's been helpful. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, loads of questions we haven't been able to answer, but we will try and get round to them. If you've got any urging questions you want help with, whether that's on a tax perspective, we can send our guide, or that's on capital gains, or on where to buy, or what to buy, or why to buy, or what to sell, or where to sell, or why to sell, then please email me. You can email me directly or email our main office, and, and we will endeavor to help you. But I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you all so much for joining. Thank you to Graham, and um, have a lovely evening or rest of your day. Thank you Thank very you. much. Bye -bye.